So I have the uh, honor and pleasure of serving as the director of programs for the Alexander Williams Jr. Center for Education, Justice, and Ethics. My name is Cameron Van Patterson, and uh, next month we'll mark one year uh, here with the University of Maryland and the Judge Williams Center. Uh, and I am just so excited to be part of the legacy of Judge Williams. And there are many chapters yet written uh, that the center is going to be authoring in the future. Uh, but I want to take this time to welcome you and thank you for making time out of your day, out of your lives, out of your schedules to join us. Uh, we know that there are many things happening, many demands on your time. And you yet you are here with us this evening to recognize individuals and organizations that we believe are doing a tremendous work here in Maryland and indeed throughout the world. And so this evening, uh, we are beginning a new chapter. This evening marks the inaugural lecture series, the Judge Alexander Williams Jr. Lecture, which is going to be an annual event. Uh, and you are here at the beginning with us, and we appreciate that. We appreciate that. Let me <coughs> begin by uh, just a few program notes. Unfortunately, our Master of Ceremony, uh, Michelle D. Bernard, uh, is unable to be here this evening. Uh, she had a medical emergency late last night, um, and so she was not able to, to join us today. But I believe she is going to be okay, uh, and we are praying for her, and our thoughts are with her uh, this evening. Um, I will be uh, standing in for Ms. Bernard, um, and I want to just take this opportunity briefly to pause, take a breath, and take inventory of this moment that we're living in, this space that we're in right now. Uh, it's very important that we recognize the season that we're in. And we're going to be talking about the relevance of the center to this, this chapter, this season that we're in. Uh, but I want to point to the words of Justice Marshall, uh, who once said that where you see wrong or inequality or injustice, speak out, because this is your country. This is your democracy. Make it, protect it, pass it on. Very sage words, sage words, and I think very timely. So it's just something to reflect on this evening as we talk about the importance of ethical leadership and civic responsibility. At this time, I would like to invite the president of our board of directors, Mr. Craig Long, to the stage, and he's going to uh, discuss the mission of the center. Thank you, Cameron. Um, you know, this is the second large event we've had for this organization, and um, when I look out again into this audience and I see all these folks that have had these long relationships with Judge Williams and I sit back and reflect on my own because it's been almost 20 years since I uh, was fortunate to be selected to serve as a judicial law clerk to Judge Williams and I remember those times in his chambers like it was yesterday and you know when I think back and reflect on those what's interesting though is that my recollection of those times was not was less about the cases that we saw or the opinions that we wrote, but more about the discussions that we had and the wisdom that he imparted to me and my law clerk during those period of times. As even in the little things, you know, when, uh, when judge would give tours followed by civic lessons to the hundreds of students he opened his chambers to and his courtroom to, and for those kids who otherwise would not get to see the legal system from that perspective, but instead were generally coming to court to see one of their family members being hauled off to jail. And just those experiences that he provided and those things that he imparted just stood out to me. 
And what stood out to me the most and was how he handled the litigants before him, the cases that he had in front of him. And regardless of the issues that he was facing, you got a sense of the role that the judge took most seriously, and that was to be fair and to be equitable. He was keenly aware of the inequalities in society and saw firsthand the many disparities in our justice system as it pertains to people of color, underrepresented, and underserved, including the minimum or the mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines that he was bound to follow. And it was while then he would encourage Jessica and I to do our parts in addressing those inequalities, the judge never took himself out of that equation. Um, you see, while many would see a federal judgeship as the pinnacle of a legal career, he saw his legacy as being more than a historic political victory or decades on the bench. He was restless, and he saw the need to do more, and he regularly talked about wanting to start in an organization that could affect change through scholarly research and providing a forum for discussing the prevailing issues facing underserved and historically disadvantaged communities, particularly in Prince George's County in Maryland, but ultimately in the country and across the world. So when the judge called me, I'll never forget that time in 2012 and told me that he was stepping down. He was gonna tender his resignation to President Obama in his last year. I was honored when he asked me to serve as his president. And it's so amazing how I look now, how much this center has accomplished in such a short period of time. From the work that it's done with the reentry of former offenders to society um, and the community outreach, it, community outreach and civic engagement in Baltimore and Prince George's County, to the impact that the judge is having now and has had through his commissions. And now we are here kicking off our inaugural lecture series and taking one step further to the judge realizing his vision and his lifelong mission. So again, I wanna thank you all for coming. We certainly appreciate your support, you know, your constant um, encouragement to the judge and to the center, and we just look forward to so much more that we're gonna have, and, um, and I just wanna again welcome you to our inaugural lecture series. So, at this point, I would say if you can direct your attention to the screen, we have a little bit of a video presentation for you. I first met Judge Williams was in 2004. I was brought before him because I had been uh, lumped into a conspiracy. I felt that the overall circumstances did not warrant uh, a life uh, sentence. I attempted to give him a sentence uh, below that and the uh, United States Court of Appeals directed that I give him a life sentence. And uh, I put on the record at sentencing that I didn't like that. I committed a crime, and I had to pay for my crime. But life plus 10 years for 60 grams of crack cocaine, that's kind of unbelievable. In my heart, I knew that Judge Williams tried to do the best he could. I thanked him for trying to give me a lesser sentence. I uh, sent uh, a letter on his behalf. I was excited when uh, President Obama uh, wrote him back and uh, commuted a sentence uh, to time served. He's now back in the community, and he's uh, helping individuals similarly situated. My time here now is to give back. There are men and women that are incarcerated now that need a voice. So I want to make sure that they have an outlet, that they have somebody they can come to.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Evans Ray, Jr. Hi, it's Taraji B. Henson. So sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm always working. Hello, everyone. I have tears in my eyes. The old lady y'all saw up there, she was 96. That was my grandmother. She died about three weeks ago. Guess who came? <laughs> Judge Williams. And you can't tell me that this young man doesn't have a heart for all walks of life. Not just, he don't see color. And this is my opinion, and I dealt with him personally. He sees human beings, and he's fair. I don't know much about him, but I know I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for that letter. <laughs> and I'm grateful for him, his wife, his family, his kids, all of them. You know Judge Williams, he's a DC native, graduated from public school, graduated from Howard, uh, three degrees, three, uh, three degrees he earned, including his law degree, first family member to graduate from college. His wife Joyce is in the audience. Hello, Miss Joyce. I just want to come down and hug you because you got a heck of a husband, so I know you have to be a hell of a woman. Uh, he has three sons, eight grandchildren. He came to PG County to further his career in the legal field and has done an awesome job. Uh, he works on all sides of criminal defense, attorney and public defender, prosecutor, Prince George's first African-American elected at the state's attorney, federal judge over 20 years. He called the shots, the balls, the strikes, that's a foul. <laughs> he was there, and he was fair. And I can say that because I dealt with him. And I will never, ever forget a statement that was made in court going through trial. Prosecutors told Judge Whitten he had to give me life. Judge Whitten took his glasses off and said, this is my courtroom. <laughs> what do you mean I have to give him life? He said, and gave me a different time. He said, if y'all don't like it, appeal it. You got five days. Well, they appealed it, and I ended up with life plus 10 years, which is in here, and you guys have read it, and uh, he put on the record. He said, I felt like it was cruel and usual punishment. And I was like, wow. I'm looking at him like, okay, you really know that this was unfair. So what it told me was that I need to go inside this prison and do what I'm supposed to do, and that's what I tried to do. I started programs helping brothers that couldn't read, couldn't write, NA, AA, because it's, it's everybody in there. I formed groups so big, and all I kept in mind was that this judge stuck up for me. So what can I do to help somebody else? I'm a fairly religious man, and there's a scripture. There are companions ready to crush one another, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Man, I love you. I mean that. Everything that you do, the people that you help. It's something in here about letters. I went over here to College Park for him. We had to do an interview with a news station, and he was at his desk. And so when I read what I was looking at in here today, it said people write him from institution, and he reads the letters. I personally watched that. He touched me again. Like, so I'm thinking, so when we write a judge, I'll just take, if there's any more judges in here, which I know it is, y'all take the letter and throw it to the side, you know, or the clerk get it and nobody else, y'all don't see it. But that's not true. I watched this man open up a letter and he said, I'm gonna have to write him back. He might not even remember that, but I remember. I just sat there flabbergasted. and I just, wow, Judge Williams. You, 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 you are everything that, 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 that you portray that you, 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 you setting records. Like they say, the footsteps in the sand, I'm following yours, man. I don't have no choice. Because at the end of the day, you're here to help people like myself. It's all walks of life incarcerated. They need a voice. They need someone to advocate for them. They need somebody that sincerely wants to help. And returning citizens, all of them not bad. All of them not good. But I think Judge Williams know who is who. I believe that in my heart. When you can look at a person and you say, wow, I 
I think this man got a chance, or I think this woman got a chance. And not only with the men and women that are in jail, he didn't forget the parents that look out for the kids that are incarcerated. He didn't forget the kids. He didn't forget anybody. Long story short, his interest is assisting in reforming criminal justice, helping those returning from prison and those with records, inspiring young people, and working to reduce mandatory minimum sentences. That's the Judge Williams I know, and I want to give him a hand. This is not me when I speak, and I speak to a lot of people. I speak from here. A little bit about me. December 16, 2004, we, I caught a case in a conspiracy. Had a mistrial that Judge Williams took me out of the case, severed me. Come March, it's time for the second trial. We do the second trial. Everything is, is going fine. Got a chance to win, got an entrapment defense. Can't tell you. I mean, Judge Williams just felt like it was entrapment there. We went through everything. I ended up with life plus 10 years. Uh, he recommended that I go to Cumberland FCI. I never forget that. The prosecutor said, why are you sending him to Cumberland? They said, because I want him to get the 500-hour program. The prosecutor said, he ain't no drug addict. The judge said, well, his wife said he drink a little liquor. <laughs> <laughs> And they put me in for Cumberland in the 500 hour program, <laughs> you know? So we did that. I got to moving around through the system. That's when I started programming, programming, programming. Long story short, I wrote a letter to Obama in June of 2006, in May of 2016. I didn't mention anything about clemency, nor did I know that Judge Williams had wrote a letter for me. Obama and his wife wrote me back June the 25th saying, thank you for the letter, Mr. Ray. We appreciate it. Never telling me I'm going home. And I told him, I said, I'm still going to be behind this wall helping the men and women back here that need help, Mr. Obama. And August the 3rd came, a letter came. When I got the letter, it was a yellow envelope like this from President Obama in the White House. And I got nervous. So one of the guards was like, what's Obama doing writing you? I said, why wouldn't he write me? I'm somebody. <laughs> I'm somebody. I am somebody. But guess not. We all are somebody. This thing is about each one teach one, and that's what this young man does. That's my format. Each one teach one. It don't, ain't no big eyes or little use when it come to him. It's about helping others. This is a letter from Obama. I let the judge read it first. It's short, and I'm going to get off this podium. I don't know who knows. His wife probably know. Once I came home, went to the halfway house, I was diagnosed with third stage rectal cancer. Don't worry about it. I'm a fighter. For 12 years, ain't kill me. Ain't nothing going to kill me. <laughs> then I got God in my life, and I circled myself around good people. I went through surgery at 10 o'clock one morning. I came out 6 in the evening. Never been cut, stabbed, or anything in prison. Got the biggest scar in the world on my stomach. But I uh, went through chemotherapy because they said that I had to get, they had to get it out of me because it was, it was that bad. <laughs> Lo and behold, Judge Williams. <laughs> He's just awesome. Get a call, speak to the judge, tell me to stay in prayer. I'm in his family prayers. I'm in, he just told me he got me. And I, and I believe that. I was supposed to stay in the hospital for two weeks. I was out in five days. Walking around the hospital, holding the back of my whip. <laughs> with the IV, I don't want nobody to see my buns, you hear me? <laughs> so we get through all that, I come home. I go through chemotherapy six months. The mayor had gave me a job in DC prior to that. They kept my job for me, I was gone nine months. That was my, this is my first good government job. And they loved me and I loved them. <sighs> prior to that job, I come out of there, Judge Williams, I talk to him, we speak. He showed me nothing but love and respect. And he said, man, you're going to be fine. And coming from him was an honor and a pleasure. So today, I say to everybody in here, man, we need more men like him. I'm not saying they're not in here, but he's going to be outspoken about his. You stand for something or you fall for anything, this brother's standing for something. And I respect it. And guess what? I'm just a little fella. But I've been around some big fellas. 
and some beautiful women. And I want to tell all y'all, I'm grateful for everybody being here, hearing me. The judge told me to speak, but I think it's his turn. So without any further ado, the man of the hour, Judge Alexander William Jr. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Evans Ray, for that very kind introduction. I'm humbled and grateful for your words, and I'm very appreciative of your story and our relationship. The issues we work on together fall clearly within the mission of the Judge Alexander Williams Jr. Center on Education, Justice, and Ethics. And uh, we thank all of you all for coming uh, uh, today. By way of background, the Judge A.W. Center was invited about two years ago to become a part of the academic program here at the University of Maryland College Park. The person who reached out to me about two years ago and convinced me to become a part of this great university is the president of the University of Maryland who, as most of us now know, has been in the news as of late. Uh, Dr. Wallace Lowe epitomizes <laughs> Dr. Wallace Lowe epitomizes something that Dr. Martin Luther King once said, and I quote, be conscious, ask the question, is it right? If there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. Before delivering this lecture, please allow me to take the personal privilege of inviting Dr. Wallace Lowe, the president of the University of Maryland, to bring greetings on this wonderful evening. Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Judge Williams. This is a wonderful event. There's fantastic hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> and what I've discovered, nothing is for free. <laughs> so I'm happy to say a few words, Judge Williams, um, as the price for admission to this very special event. Thank you all for being here and supporting the work of this center. Very briefly, this is the Alex Williams, Judge Alex Williams Jr. Center for Education, Justice, and Ethics, and look at the order of those words. What is the link between education on the one hand, which is the mission of this university, and ethics? Because to educate somebody without educating that person in what's right, in what's ethical, is potentially to educate somebody who's a menace to society. And the link between education and doing what's right is justice, fairness, treating people equally. I am so honored and pleased that we have Judge Alex Williams Jr. as a center at this university. And let me just conclude by saying, I am very, very eager to hear your remarks. Your remarks about ethical leadership and civic responsibility, especially in these incredibly fraught times when we are, in effect, fighting for the heart and soul of our democracy. And we need people with the values and the ethics and the commitment, such as Judge Alex Williams, to lead us forward. Thank you very much for bringing your center here. We just emerged from an emotional and grueling election. 
I leave to the pundits and the competing sides to put their spin and spins on the implications of the election. What of course is clear yet disheartening is that America remains deeply and bitterly divided. And we wonder how long and what it will take for healing. Among the challenging and bifurcating issues and matters we confront across this country today include the matter of developing a fair immigration and migrant policy, the matter of the daunting task of admission officials charged with considering diversity and merit and background and test scores and other factors trying to achieve a balanced and fair policy for admission to colleges, universities, and professional schools. The matter of voting, redistricting, partisan gerrymandering, and the related claims of fraud, voter intimidation, and other tactics of voter suppression. The matter of security and guns and the horrific violence and incidents of domestic terrorism possibly influenced by the threat of social media or driven by either a culture of hate, anger, hostility, bigotry, extremism, racism, trappings of anti-Semitism, most recently seen and the sending of pipe bombs to two former presidents and other prominent persons in the news, the Pittsburgh killing leaving 12 dead in a place of worship, the shooting and killing of two African Americans at a grocery store outside of Louisville, Kentucky, and just last night, the latest mass killing of 12 at the Borderline Bar and Grill in Thousand Oaks, California, where a gunman using smoke grenades and a semi-automatic handgun fired upon college students dancing and having fun. The matter of increasing persons with mental and behavior challenges in this country. The matter of the increasing polarization political rancor, demagoguery, partisan rhetoric, and other divisions which encourage an environment of lawlessness and other divisions which encourage an environment where people don't respect the opinions of others. The matter of the criminal justice reform and addressing the alarming rate of incarcerations and the disparate impact of the criminal justice system on people of color. The matter of the rift and schism, schism rather, in police community relations. And finally, the matter of bridging disparities and gaps. Gaps in wealth, gaps in social and economic equality, gaps in the delivery of adequate health care for everybody, gaps in access to the digital age and gaps in achievement of a meaningful education. Oh, what a complex and ethical dilemma. Still before, 64 years after the Supreme Court in Brown versus the Board of Education ordered the states to integrate public schools and their jurisdictions at all deliberate speed. Despite Brown, the country simply has not eliminated the vestiges of former de jure segregation and so many systems, school systems in this country continue to maintain dual systems of education and the desegregation plans and other policies have simply been ineffective. These are just but a few of the hot button issues of our time before us. We cannot turn a blind eye to these difficult divisive and emotional issues, nor can we think that the passage of time will automatically erase the divisions, the violence, and the madness. In my view, 
the notion of civil engagement is a far better solution to begin to address many of these problems. What is civil engagement? Civil engagement is getting involved. It includes collaboration by various stakeholders and facets in the community to develop influence and promote policies and goals and values which benefit society and improve the public good. Through activating our minds, employing our energies, engaging our resolves and resources to solve common problems, those of us civilly engaged can make a difference. We can advance the public good and values of the community. We can improve the quality of life and the society at large. Civic engagement takes many forms. It's volunteering, it's mentoring, it's voting, it's philanthropy. It is providing leadership, it is educating, it is attending a community meeting, it is serving as an activist, it is advocating or both proposing initiatives which prick one's interest, be it political, social, economic, environmental, educational, all of which raise the quality of life and benefit the interests of society. The hallmark of any great society is measured by the extent and degree of involvement or engagement in activities and projects benefiting the community and advancing the public good. Now beyond individual citizens, there are mounds of stakeholders who are positioned to contribute to civil engagement. They include the business, retail, and corporate community, the faith-based community, the general media and entertainment communities as well as social media companies, computer and high tech companies, community centers and organizations, professional associations, nonprofits, and philanthropical organizations. Other stakeholders include the entities providing and contributing to the delivery of health care services and the educational and academic community just to name a few. In fact, with reference to the university community, just this past spring semester, Dr. Wallace Lowe, the president of the University of Maryland College Park, emphasized the focus on, quote, do good initiatives under the rubric of civic engagement for the campus and university community at large. But in this inaugural address this evening, let me lift up just for a few more minutes the role of two stakeholders. One, the responsibility of citizens and their role in the context of civil engagement. And second, the importance of leadership and the ethical responsibility of public service and its relevance to civic engagement. Let me preface my reports as to the responsibility of role of citizens by acknowledging the excitement at witnessing a record turnout both in early voting and at the polls this past Tuesday. 113 million citizens cast ballots this past midterm election. Particularly encouraging is the large increase of young people registering and participating in the election. I listened with interest at the report that 19 black women who ran to become judges all won in Houston, Texas. <laughs> My hope is that this voting outpouring continues in future elections. My fear is that the sole reason motivating many to vote was based primarily on whether one approved or disapproved of the actions, statements, and decisions of the person occupying the White House. 
In terms of citizen responsibility, it appears to me that the lack of significant civil engagement is often driven by the fact that life has become comfortable to many of us, so much so that we are wrapped up in our own everyday routine lives and we show little motive to engage and to volunteer and to get involved. The great challenge is to address the complacency of our citizens who feel they have it made and therefore go about their living carefree as a bedroom community, unconcerned about who is elected and oblivious to performance of public leadership. We tend to voice our concerns or show passion or energy only when something suddenly hits us, like a reduction of trash pickups or a pending increase in our property tax rate. Civic engagement starts with exercising the right to vote. Some only vote when prodded to do so by Oprah Winfrey or Taylor Swift. Contrary to the turnout the past Tuesday, far too many citizens are stuck in complacency. Historically, do not vote. Have no interest in participating in midterms or state and local elections. Do not take the time to research the qualification and record of candidates on the ballot. And they know very little about the issues surrounding the election. The challenges are clear. How can we get more citizens to become more involved and generate a passion for removing the barriers to complacency? How can we, as part of our civic engagement responsibility, encourage more citizens to volunteer and give back? What kind of activism must be employed to hold our public officials accountable and to make sure that elected officials are prepared and are vigilant, fearless, and effective in challenging unfair barriers and raising the right questions on behalf of their constituencies. And more importantly, how can we bridge the generation gap and bring forth the millennials who enjoy digital comfort and expertise and the older generations who possess some historical context? bringing them together to learn from each other in a common goal to assist individuals and the communities in reaching potential and addressing challenges. We must get better informed and educated with respect to the issues affecting us, except, as I said earlier, for some crisis which hits us and where we simply react instead of being more proactive, we simply are not involved. If I were to momentarily put on my professorial hat and give a quiz and ask each of you here this evening to name your school board district, your councilmatic district, your legislative district, and your congressional district wherein you reside, or if I ask you in this quiz to name your school board representative, your county or city legislative representative, your state senator, and your three delegates to the General Assembly from your district, I suspect that beyond perhaps naming the governor and two other senators, perhaps your congressperson, maybe the county exec or mayor, many of us here, without doing any research, are unable to pass my quiz. How many here have received calls from friends around election time asking you, who shall I vote for? Many public officials across this country often get elected and stay in office because of our own apathy and lack of interest in getting information. Civic engagement, therefore, is essential to generate community interest and to provide critical information on issues important to citizens. Our community in Maryland, and for that matter most of the country, have too many uninformed citizens who do not know what is going on. 
and some, quite frankly, don't give a damn. There are no adequate or cogent reasons for individuals not registering and not participating in elections. Claiming that their vote will not mean anything or will have no effect on their status or fearing that one may be called to jury duty or not showing at the polls because it's raining or they don't have time or there's a scheduling conflict or you don't believe in the political system, those are inadequate reasons for not voting. <laughs> Citizen engagement and involvement is the key to motivating our citizens to participate and to understand the relevant issues which impact our community and helping them appreciate the importance of electing responsible representatives and leadership in public office. Now before concluding with a few remarks on the other stakeholder, that is public leadership, let me say something about the relationship between civil rights and civic responsibilities. Back in the 50s and 60s, the focus was primarily on civil rights through struggle and sacrifice, sweat and blood, and even some loss of life by dedicated and responsible civil rights warriors, significant civil rights protections such as the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 65 have been enacted. The focus now is to consider what being responsible means today. Being responsible includes moving from a primary civil rights focus to more of a civic and civil responsibility mode. Let me be specific. Previously, the underserved and disadvantaged communities had no influence, no ballot, no jobs, no money, no political representation, no right to vote, unable to go to certain schools. Again, this formal, open, notorious, and legally sanctioned status of exclusion and denial has been changed. Basic civil rights do currently exist. While there are many more and new challenges of injustice to be addressed, we must recognize that people previously excluded now hold positions in public and private leadership. Those previously denied the right to vote can vote. People formerly with little education or little means to get education, they do have more education and they do possess the right to go to school and learn. And many people who formerly were penniless now possess a few dollars and have resources to create a kind of community that is much more fair and just than what it was. Through legislation, litigation, court decisions, policies, executive orders, and sweat and toll, basic civil rights are now in place. Yet civil rights, these gains, without the follow through of civil and civic responsibilities are meaningless. The emphasis, therefore, is to shift from civil rights to civil responsibilities. That means, in my view, requiring people in positions of leadership and responsibility to make a difference, to question or speak out where appropriate, to create opportunities, to change the current culture, to help fairly distribute and reallocate resources, and to make a way to make education politics, and economics work in communities that formerly were the victim of injustice and, fairness and unfairness. This is the essence of the responsibility and obligation that comes with having the privilege of being a public servant. To bring, they must bring changes in the business as usual culture. They must shift from victimization to being agents and catalysts for change. They must develop a passion to represent, to reach out, to level the playing field, and to do what is ethically the right thing to do. So that being said, civil engagement does embrace a key role 
for those in public service. Candidates running for office must offer and provide, not vague hyperpole, but detailed information with respect to their specific strategies for addressing the critical issues and challenges that we as citizens and constituents, constituents confront. This is not an easy task, and public officials must not sink to the plateau of mediocrity, but they must muster up the energy, the commitment, and the preparation to ethically represent their constituencies. I served in public office for 32 years. I was the chairman of the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, twice elected as the state's attorney for Prince George's County, and nominated and confirmed for a lifetime federal appointment on the United States District Court for the District of Maryland. But I had to constantly remind myself that I was not there just in search of a title or power or prestige or to beat my chest with self-centeredness or to run for office to earn a lucrative salary or to get assigned a county car or special tags or some other perks and reasons to feed my own ego. Those things were certainly wonderful and I enjoyed those amenities. <laughs> but what I discovered early in my public service was that anyone elected or appointed to public service is required to work hard and to prepare and put in long, dedicated, and tireless hours and to ask questions and to make a difference and know and fully understand the full reach and implication of proposed bills and policies. Public leadership must assure on behalf of their constituents that there is a fair allocation of resources and tax revenues from the state and the county and municipality so as to reach all communities in areas of transportation, delivery of health care, security, employment, and education in particular. Moreover, a key mentoring role of an elected public official is to convince our students, our children, that education is not a sentence to be served, but it's an opportunity to be seized. Ethical public leadership must reject the notion of always adopting the status quo and getting preoccupied with self-preservation. They must be proactive rather than always reacting to sporadic fires suddenly arising. Ethical public leadership must be unafraid of reprisals if they take a position inconsistent with their party line. Those in public office must lead the way. They've got to lower the temperature in today's political climate. They must tone down the rhetoric when necessary. They must put aside, where you can, differences, develop relationships, set a new norm of partisan cooperation, find common ground, and collaborate with others to develop, to propose, to promote policies and positive changes which further the overall public good. Civic engagement requires that elected leadership are res act responsibly and professionally in discharging their public duties. They must shape the character of dialogue. They must set a new tone and model of professionalism and justice and fairness so that all citizens can reap their potential and the overall health of the community is advanced. Finally, elected officials must provide the moral guidance and the moral compass demonstrated by way of their actions, involvement, and activism. Duty demands that public leadership develop a strategy to transform the present trajectory of complacency, idleness, and inactivity of citizens and steer those citizens toward civic engagement. This kind of leadership by public officials is an important component and ingredient of civil engagement. 
I trust that I am not discouraging persons from considering public service this evening, but it is important that the exercise of this kind of ethical public leadership here in Maryland be the standard and serve as a national model for ethical and responsible leadership on Capitol Hill and throughout the entire nation. I close by thanking each of you for joining me this evening for this inaugural Judge Alexander Williams lecture. Yes, the challenges before us today are enormous, yet there's no need to sit back and become a casual observer. We must energize ourselves and get busy. The great theologian Howard Thurman once wrote, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go for it. Because what the world needs are people who have come alive. Thank you so much for coming this evening and I appreciate you listening to these words. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Judge Williams. We're now moving the program to recognize individuals or organizations that are doing good work in the community. I'd like to invite Dr. Patterson back up. Uh, one of the main anchors in Judge Williams' uh, vision is highlighting those in the community that exemplify the, the privileges I think they're going to put up uh, one of the sides, one of the pillars um, in terms of what the center is all about. Um, hearing those words, when we were working on this program, the judge was very adamant that he really wanted to highlight the work of the community, and that's going to be one of the mainstays. Uh, you, talk, you heard him talk about it a little bit in his lecture in terms of ego. He's really interested in, and focused and motivated and, and appreciative, he gets fuel for everything that he's doing by seeing the good works of others. And so we're very excited. We have about five awards that we want to try to highlight in the community. Dr. Patterson. Okay. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Judge. And thank you, Mr. Ray, for your comments. I want to uh, take a moment here to call your attention to the back of your program uh, just before you see some of the sponsor uh, organizations that have uh, generously supported us this evening. Uh, there are uh, some student groups who are tabling uh, just beyond these doors. We encourage you after the presentations to uh, stop and take note. Uh, these are student groups here at the University of Maryland who are doing exactly what Judge Williams just spoke about. And so we encourage you to uh, stop by their tables and uh, learn a little bit more about what they're doing, the work they're doing with uh, the Do Good Institute. I also want to continue to encourage you to support the center. We are very fortunate in that we have just established an endowment fund for the Judge Alexander Williams Junior Center. Um, and the endowment fund is going to allow for us to continue the work and to build really an institutional legacy that will continue to uh, promote education, justice, and ethics uh, beyond our lifetimes. Uh, and so uh, you'll be uh, able to learn more about that and we'll have more information for you about that. But uh, please, um, after the presentations, take time to stop and learn more about the endowment fund. Uh, we have some colleagues uh, in the Breezeway who will be there to assist you and share more information. Of course, your support is always, always greatly appreciated. As Sydney mentioned, we're moving to the awards portion of our program. And this is a really great opportunity because it gives us a chance to recognize individuals and organiza organizations that are already doing uh, very, very important work. And so uh, you're going to have an opportunity to learn a little bit about organizations in the region. Uh, some of the awardees that we're recognizing this evening are people and organizations that 
the center has already formed partnerships with uh, to move forward and implement programs in 2019. Specifically, there are two areas we're going to be focusing on in the coming calendar year, uh, and that is mental health and wellness and awareness, uh, and also uh, education, particularly thinking about how to better serve young men of color um, in Baltimore and in Prince George's County. So definitely stay tuned and feel free afterwards, after the award presentations, to uh, remain and linger and enjoy the beverages and uh, talk and learn more about some of the organizations that we're going to be uh, highlighting here this evening. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to <coughs> share a little bit about an organization uh, that's going to be recognized this evening, and they're going to be receiving the Judge A.W. Center Education Award. And there are some brief bios in your program about these organizations. I'm just going to share a little bit with you about the Holistic Life Foundation. <clears throat> the Holistic Life Foundation is a Baltimore-based nonprofit organization committed to nurturing the wellness of children and adults in underserved communities through a comprehensive approach which helps children develop their inner lives through yoga, mindfulness, and self-care. Holistic Life Foundation demonstrates a deep commitment to learning, community, and stewardship of the environment. The foundation is also committed to developing high-quality, evidence-based programs and curriculum to improve community well-being. One of the things that's so important about the Holistic Life Foundation, uh, and unfortunately our, our board member, Katrina Rouse, uh, is traveling, she's on her way here, um, and she probably will be here a little shortly, but the Holistic Life Foundation is taking on the problem of mental health from a proactive position, you know, really emphasizing wellness and mindfulness and what it means to uh, work with young people and help teach them the skills that are required to really become capable and able to master themselves and master their emotions, develop that emotional intelligence. And I just want to share a, a brief word that our board member, Ms. Rouse, wanted me to share with you all about the Holistic Life Foundation. Katrina wrote, <coughs> I'm honored to introduce the Holistic Life Foundation and their founders. For many years, the Holistic Life Foundation has provided mindful training to K-12 students in Baltimore City. They serve 42 area schools, 10,000 students a week, and have trained and employed 30,000 Baltimore youth. Through, this fine, through their fine work, they exemplify the goals of the AW Center. And it is especially fitting that they receive this award tonight at the University of Maryland, where all three founders were students. On behalf of the entire board of directors of the Judge A.W. Center, congratulations. We are inspired by your work. With no further ado, please join me in welcoming Andres Gonzalez, co-founder of the Holistic Life Foundation. Good evening, how y'all doing today? All right, all right. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it really is a, like truly an honor. Uh, myself and the other two founders met each other here. I mean, they're brothers, but I met them here. And um, without this school, we wouldn't be doing the work we're doing, making that impact all across the nation, all across the world, providing these techniques. Uh, I really don't know how much time I have to talk for a little bit of while. I, was, I wanted to lead y'all through a little practice to get yourselves together. Is that cool if I do a little practice for everybody? Yeah, all right, all right. Because uh, I can tell you about what we do, but I'd rather y'all experience a little something, right? So I'm gonna welcome y'all to get into a comfortable seated position, head, neck, and spine aligned, feet grounded on the floor. 
I invite you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so and just start taking deep breaths in and out your nose. As you inhale, feel your lungs expanding. As you exhale, push out any anxiety, stress, or worry out of your body. I invite you to use your imagination. And I want you to picture all those people that you love, whether they're here, far away, whether they're living or no longer living, because remember that love knows no boundaries. And with your breath, I want you to send those people love. If you happen to have a thought or distraction that comes in your mind, acknowledge it. Let it pass and return back to that image of all those people that you love, in which each breath, I want you to send them love. And continue to use our imagination. And now I want you to picture those people that stress you out, those people that get you angry, that get you frustrated, whether they're friends, their family, co-workers, politicians. And I want you to send those people love as well. You can imagine that their anger, their hatred that they spread, the only way to conquer that is with love. And they probably need it more than anybody else. So picture all those people that frustrate you, that get you angry, and be the bigger person. Send those people love as well. Continue breathing. Nice, long, slow, deep breaths. And I want you to do one last thing for me tonight. I want you to send love to the most important person in the world, and that is yourself. So often, we pour out our love to everybody else and we forget to give love to ourselves. It may have been a long time since you told yourself that you love yourself you sent yourself love. I want you to feel that warmth of love, giving it to yourself, the warmth of love in this room with all these wonderful dynamic people in which each breath sent yourself love. invite you to bring your attention back to yourselves and slowly start wiggling your fingers and your toes and all around your wrists and your ankles. Take your time if you had your eyes closed, slowly, slowly, blink your eyes open and come back to your senses. Remember that love is the most powerful force in the universe. Together, we can make an impact. It's an honor to be here representing my organization, my other founders. Thank you so much for your time. Have a blessed and beautiful evening. Well, I'm relaxed. I don't know about you, I'm ready, okay. Thank you so much, Andres, for that and for sharing one of your practices. At this time, I'm going to invite another one of our board members to come and present the award for justice. Ladies and gentlemen, Delegate Eric Barron. It's been a rough week, I needed that. Um, I'm gonna use my cheat sheet, so excuse me, but um, I am pleased to present the uh, AW Center Justice Award. Karen York, 
Karen York is the Executive Director of the Job Opportunities Task Force. JLTF works to eliminate educational and employment barriers for low-wage workers by transforming the systems and policies that create and perpetuate those barriers. Since I've known Karen, I've personally seen her take on legislation and policy issues on her shoulders with unbelievable skill, willpower, intellect, and passion. I'd like to give you three brief examples. The Second Chance Act. About one third of all American men have been arrested at some point before the age of 23. The immediate consequences of crime are jail time, fines, fees, parole, but a record also comes with penalties that can affect nearly every aspect of a person's life. Employment, public assistance, housing, voting rights. The Second Chance Act was signed into law in 2015 and people are now getting to take advantage of the opportunity to wipe their slate clean with uh, expungement and shielding. This is because of Karen York. Number two, the Justice Reinvestment Act. Karen was appointed as the only community advocate and only member of a nonprofit to the Justice Reinvestment Coordinating Council. This was a bipartisan group of public officials and justice uh, experts brought together to make recommendations on the reform of Maryland's criminal justice system. It was a nationwide data-driven approach to improve public safety, reduce corrections and spending, and reinvest savings in evidence-based strategies to, re to decrease crime and reduce recidivism. These recommendations were put into legislation and has resulted in a fair, safer Maryland, and has contributed to the state actually leading the nation in reducing unnecessary incarceration. That bill doesn't pass the state's legislature without Karen York. Number three, the Maryland Fair Access to Education Act, the so-called ban the box on college applications. The bill expands access to education to returning citizens by moving the question of criminal history to its appropriate place in the application process. We know that education is the key to exponentially reducing recidivism rates and allowing returning citizens to be productive, employed, and move on from their troubled past. Again, this bill doesn't get introduced, let alone passed, and certainly doesn't override the governor's veto without Karen York. Dr. King said, and I'll paraphrase, if a woman is called to be a street sweeper, she should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted, or as Beethoven composed music, or as Shakespeare wrote poetry. She should sweep the streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did her job well. This is the spirit within which Karen takes on her advocacy on behalf of the least of us. I am pleased to present the A.W. Center Justice Award to Karen York. It is such an honor to be here this evening, to be honored with the Justice Award on behalf of the judge, you know how we always have to look at the, we have to get it right, the Judge Alexander Williams Jr. Center for Education, Justice, and Ethics. Um, Delegate Barron mentioned the Justice Re Reinvestment Act, and if you indulge me, I wanna talk a bit about um, how I first met Judge Williams. So during the Justice Reinvestment uh, Act process, 
Um, there were a number of recommendations that came out of the Coordinating Council, but there was a recommendation that was missing. And Delegate Barron and I really pushed to ensure that this recommendation was included. And this recommendation was the elimination of mandatory minimums for drug offenders. And the reason why we felt that this was so important, <laughs> the reason why we felt that this is so important was because if this is the Justice Reinvestment Act and we're seeking to reduce our prison population, one of the easiest ways to do that is eliminate mandatory minimums, no brainer. Another reason was that we found that Maryland, in terms of our mandatory minimums for drug offenders, we were actually worse off than Mississippi. That is not something that we should be proud of. That is not something that we should brag about. And it's not something that we can ignore given the fact that it was an overwhelming number of African American men that were caught up in these mandatory minimum sentences. And so Delegate Barron, as we were trying to figure out how we were gonna push this, because no one was even trying to br bring up mandatory minimums, like they weren't even trying to hear it. So Delegate Barron said that we need to bring some folks into the mix. And so he was talking about this individual named Judge Alexander Williams. So set up a lunch in Annapolis during session. Here comes this guy with this country draw. Now Delegate Barron said that he was from Washington, D.C., but I was like, mm-mm, he is from Alabama. Where are you from, Judge Williams? Is it really D.C.? Okay, I mean, I know that, you know, D.C. natives, they do, you know, but I, it, it was thick. So, we're having lunch and I've realized that, why have I never, why have I never worked with this individual before? Just hearing his story was so extremely powerful and just the passion that he talked about how unfair mandatory minimums were. So then he suggested that he bring in another colleague of his. Now this colleague I actually know. This colleague is Judge William Murphy, who's sitting to my left. Now, this is another icon, another individual who has worked on behalf of individuals in the criminal justice system and defended them and their families. And so we convene another lunch. I'm under the impression that we're actually going to talk about how we're gonna craft the language that's gonna go in the bill to eliminate mandatory minimums. But if you have ever gotten these two together, we were not talking about the bill. I was talking about the bill. They were bringing up stories from the 90s and the 2000s and everything else they wanted to talk about. But eventually we got to a point where I was able to get them to commit to appearing on a panel to eliminate these mandatory minimums. And they're extremely busy individuals, so this was a really big deal. But there are two particular reasons why this was an extremely big deal for me personally. The first reason was because when you have individuals like Judge Alexander Williams and Billy Murphy, when you have them in front of a committee and the passion that they speak, the expertise that comes with the experience of their work in the justice system, it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes to the individuals in Annapolis who would not expect them to really be that engaged in the legislative process at this point in their life. But more importantly, the second point was that having those two, particularly Judge Williams, sitting on that panel with me, urging for the elimination, the successful elimination of mandatory minimums, was a big deal for me personally because I was a young policy leader. And the fact that I could have someone like him up there with me, saying what I was saying, validating not just what I was saying, but validating the fact that I belonged where I was, it sent a message to my colleagues in Annapolis that I had friends in high places, and this is someone you have to start respecting. And that is so invaluable, Judge Williams, and I, can, I, I don't think I've ever told you what that has done for me both inside and outside of Annapolis. So while I am so thankful for this award, I am more thankful for your leadership, your counsel, and your friendship. Thank you. Please give Ms. York another round of applause.
this time I'm going to ask our board president, uh, Eric, I'm sorry, Craig Long, uh, to come and present the award, uh, the Judge A.W. Center Award for Ethics. Okay. Um, I have the honor of presenting the uh, Judge A.W. Center Ethics Award. But before I do, and I, I think we've been a little remiss, I, I, I just do want to acknowledge my board member, my fellow board members of the A.W. Center that are here, um, Sydney Butcher, who you've already seen, uh, Joyce Williams, Eric Barron, James Benjamin, if you're here, please raise your hands. Um, Adrian Brown, Jerlethia Franklin, Katrina Rouse, Kadwali Sony, um, Roz Tang, and Dana Williams. Um, without them, honestly, we couldn't do half this stuff. Um, there was a time when we didn't have an, a program director and anyone leading us, and we were having to do a lot of this ourselves, so it's, it's just great to be at this point now here. Um, so I, I do have the honor to present this ethics award and it's, um, it's near and dear to my heart or should I probably say near and dear to my soul because uh, this next award recipient is uh, Pastor John uh, K. Jenkins Sr., the pastor of uh, First Baptist Church of Glenarm, which I am a member. Um, pastor Jenkins has been preaching the good news since he was licensed as a minister in 1973 at the age of 15. In 1988, he became the senior pastor for First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, and by God's grace, his church membership grew from 500 to more than 10,000 today. For those of you that don't live in the county, this is a large church with a lot of congregants, and it is a church that when you ask people where they go, they have a lot to say about this church, because he has done a lot of good work. Um, he, today, he has 11,000 people attend his weekly services between two campuses, located in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Um, one of the things that um, I, I grew up uh, in, in, in churches, my, my family, and my, my uh, it's, I guess it's a sense of family business to a degree, my uh, grandfather, my great-grandfather, we can go back about four or five generations of pastors. And what kind of struck me about coming to First Baptist Church of Glen Arden and always coming through the Baptist church was just how tech savvy he was. It kind of spoke to me. Um, a little bit from that side of me, and he is a tech-savvy minister. He embraces technology through his ministry by reaching souls in global ways. He believes that the church has been appointed by God to serve the community and the nation for his glory, which is one of the reasons in some of the programs and, and, and works that that church has done through Pastor Jenkins' leadership has made significant impacts in our community. Um, his vision, his, his commitment, his mission, has always been developing dynamic disciples through discipleship, discipline, and duplication. And those of you who have gone to church know those words pretty good. Um, we have, unfortunately, Pastor Jenkins could not join us, but we do have Deacon Stanley Featherstone who's going to accept the award on behalf of the church. Deacon Featherstone. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Judge Williams, to your board and to everyone who makes this moment possible and successful. As uh, was said, Pastor Jenkins is not able to be here, but he insisted that someone come to let you know how grateful he is for your uh, recognition of his efforts to represent ethical leadership and civic engagement. And, uh, I think if he were here, he would want to say to you, thank you for leveraging who you are, your experience and your exposure to lift up a cause that can help to transform our nation. And like Mr. Ray, I too am a slightly religious person, so I think he would also want to say to you what scripture says in Galatians 6 and 9, that I pray that you will not grow weary in well-doing, but remember that in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Thank you for what you're doing, sir. This next award is, 
very special to me, and you'll see why in a moment. But in, in presenting this next award, I, I want to say something about health equity. We hear a lot in our national discourse about public health and the need for greater health care. And Dr. King, <coughs> who has been quoted several times here this evening, uh, which is appropriate given the anniversary of his assassination, once said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Many of you have heard some of the statistics about uh, mental health in particular. When we think about public health, um, sometimes we overlook mental health. Uh, I just want to share a few uh, brief stats. One in five adults experience a mental illness, and nearly 60% are not receiving treatment. Uh, looking at uh, the state of mental health uh, nationally, there are about 10.2 million adults who live with both uh, mental and substance abuse disorders. 26% uh, of homeless adults uh, live with serious mental illness. And it's estimated that uh, untreated mental illness costs the U.S. approximately $193 billion in lost earnings annually. Mental health in the context of prisons uh, is just alarming. 70% uh, of youth in state and local juvenile justice systems suffer from mental illness today. Uh, and in education, 80% of public school children affected by a mental health disorder are not receiving the treatment they require. 37% of students age 14 and older with a mental uh, health illness drop out of school. These are just some data points that I mentioned just to highlight the importance of mental health uh, and, and explain sort of why we are particularly focused on this issue um, at the center. And many of the awardees who you've seen tonight are also working in this area. And I'm about to uh, announce the award recipient <coughs> for the Judge A.W. Center's Health Equity and Awareness Award. Uh, and you're gonna hear a little bit about uh, this amazing organization and the work that they're doing in this area. Uh, if you could turn your attention to the screens at this time. Hi, it's Taraji P. Henson. So sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm always working, but certainly not complaining. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Williams and the whole team over at the A.W. Junior Center for Education justice and equity for honoring me with this award. I accept it with a full heart. I would also like to thank you for the work you've done to address legal and social inequities in vulnerable communities in Maryland and across the country. I look forward to building and working with you and the center in the very near future. Enjoy the rest of the evening and thank you again. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't figured it out by now, the Health Equity and Awareness Award goes to the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation, which was founded by actress Taraji P. Henson. And this evening, we're very fortunate to have with us the executive director of the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation, Ms. Tracy J. Jenkins. each and every one of those steps while I was sitting in that seat to make sure that the boots were going to make it. The women understand what I mean. <laughs> Thank you again for this honor. We really um, appreciate it and we are so grateful. Um, Taraji obviously couldn't be here this evening. She's um, very busy these days. Uh, she's working on Empire, the television program, as most of you know. There are two films that are coming out. Um, next month and then in January. And then of course she started this little organization called the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation a little under a year ago. Um, I am really excited about the work that's ahead. If you looked at those stats up there, I feel like most of us are either one of them 
or we know someone who can make up these numbers. Um, I certainly was very alarmed when I learned that one in five of us are walking with mental health challenges. I am one of the five. Definitely alarmed to know that 60% of us do not get the support and the help that we need. You know that the African American community makes up a high number there. So our work is to end the stigma around mental health issues in our community, and we're also looking to lift this conversation to a national level and really identify it for the crisis that it is in our community and get the support that we need to make sure that this is being addressed from birth through adulthood. Um, we are so excited for this new partnership with you. And as the president mentioned a little earlier, uh, nothing's free, right? So Taraji put this video together for us in the middle of her crazy life right before Jimmy Kimmel the other night. And that wasn't free. So we are gonna ask of you, Judge Williams, to please lend us your expertise, your wisdom, and your guidance as we sort of push this conversation into the public and we push for legislation that will make sure that our boys and girls, men and women in the African American community get the support that they need. Again, thank you so much for this, and I will let Taraji know that it was a splendid evening, um, and good night, and have a beautiful, beautiful journey. Hopefully we'll get to see you again soon. We'll be in Washington, D.C. in May uh, for a conference on the state of uh, mental health in the African American community. Thank you much. And I uh, just want to uh, reiterate how important it is that we support uh, organizations that are doing this work. And um, it's, uh, it's an honor that uh, I get a chance to uh, support directly the Boris uh, Lawrence Henson Foundation. And I'll just sh share by way of context, Judge and myself uh, and uh, Karen Miller had a chance to uh, attend the launch of uh, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation in California recently. And uh, I was so impressed with the work that they're doing. We're gonna be working together soon. And so uh, we wanted to sow into that work ourselves. And so we have just a modest gift that we're gonna present to uh, Ms. Jenkins this evening on behalf of the Judge Alexander Williams Center. Our final uh, award uh, this evening, uh, I'm going to make. I uh, asked Mr. K.J. Sony if he would uh, come forward. Uh, he's one of the board members of the J. Franklin. Uh, excuse me, J. Franklin. <laughs> I don't know where my mind is on. Yeah, that's right. That's the. Uh, uh, I'm the founding member, the Judge A.W. Center Board Directors, Mr. Sony. Um, yes. The Judge uh, A.W. Center Service. Servant uh, Leadership Award goes to the Center for Social Change. The Center for Social Change is a nonprofit with headquarters in Howard County, Maryland. I visited the center and was given a full tour of the center and a presentation of its mission and services. The center provides supportive services for those individuals with cognitive and developmental disabilities and impairments. The program and support services of the center include family support, vocational training and employment support, coordination of community training, and habitation and living arrangements. The center partners with other community stakeholders in the community whose mission is similar in terms of enhancing independence self-determination for a vulnerable community and providing them the services needed and the opportunity for them to live a healthy, safe, and valued living. 
these important services fall to those with disabilities. And it clearly is within the mission of the Judge Alexander Williams Jr. Center, which focuses on issues and challenges of the disadvantaged and undeserved. Will Mr. Sahid Sajid Tarar, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer, and Jesse Singh, Chief Operating Officers, will you come forward to accept the Judge A.D. Center, A.W. Center Servant Leadership Award? Uh, let's give them a hand. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am so honored in awe of such powerful audiences here, so such powerful guests tonight, and I'm really humbled to see other awardees, what beautiful work they're all doing. So I would like to give everybody uh, a big round of applause for this evening. There are minorities in every community, and then there are minorities in minorities. I call them super minorities, super minorities. And not many people reach out to super minorities, but Judge William is the beacon of light for us super minorities for years and years. So thank you, Judge William, for always being there for us, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. I just wanted to say a few things for Judge William, Alexander William. Thank you so much for being a role model for us, for the minority communities. Here I wanted to say a little bit about our organization as well. We are dealing, uh, we have a couple of, I have today in this room, I have a couple of common things. I'm a University of Baltimore Law School graduate myself. Uh, I'm a son of a lawyer, I'm a brother of a lawyer, but I wanted to, I wanted to serve. This is a common thing in between uh, Judge Williams and myself. I wanted to serve the community. So uh, after uh, 20 years of uh, a very successful uh, profession, I made a U-turn and I came to this side. And imagine we are serving more than 100 dis developmentally disabled people. And imagine if you have, have 100 kids, those cannot express where the pain is in their body and how difficult the job is. Just deep in myself, we both consider this is God's work and they are God's children and we're taking care of it. But thank you for recognizing us. It's a wonderful evening, and God bless you all. I just want to say a couple of uh, words before I go. Uh, I, I know Judge Williams since he was a state attorney in PG County. And uh, from there on onwards, our friendship grew. And then he, uh, he was run running for the Congress. Unfortunately, we lost. But uh, as for the better, he was appointed uh, judge by President Clinton, and here we are. And this organization, since he formed, he invited me, and I, it's my privilege to be board member here. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. All right, we're at the end, and uh, let me make some closing remarks. First of all, I want to uh, publicly uh, acknowledge uh, uh, my wife, uh, Sir Joyce, and uh, <laughs> Joyce, uh, you know, it's hard to do anything without the support of your uh, better half, and uh, when I told her I was uh, leaving the federal bench, she said, this, this boy then bumped his head, you know. <laughs> But uh, uh, she's certainly been uh, in my corner there. I also see uh, my son uh, Alex here. And, uh, is, is my other son here, Johnny? Yeah, there's Johnny there. And Alex and my, uh, my uh, third son uh, is uh, working this evening, but uh, his uh, wonderful, lovely wife is here, Lael. Uh, let me thank all of the board members uh, uh, 
of the Judge A.W. Center. If you're here, why don't you just stand? All of my board members uh, who are here. Yes. And uh, Katrina, uh, continue standing, Katrina. Let me say, Katrina came all the way from uh, San Francisco. Uh, uh, she uh, is a local Baltimore, a wonderful lady, and she's been with my center. She was my law clerk uh, uh, a few years ago, and she was supposed to give the award today for the Holistic uh, Foundation, but uh, she got here later. Plane just got here, but uh, she's a faithful board member and just a wonderful person, so I thank her you know, for that. I also want to thank uh, publicly the staff, uh, Dr. Cameron Patterson, who is the program director. Uh, for this center, uh, you've seen him. Uh, I, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Aaron Jacobs. Aaron, stand. Uh, Aaron is the uh, center's coordinator. Uh, Karen Miller is our fundraising consultant. Where's Karen? Uh, we have many uh, uh, student assistants here. We have. Uh, Kayla Williams, I don't think she's here uh, today. Uh, she's at the uh, University of Baltimore School of Law. We have James Hidalgo. Is he here, James here? Yes. <laughs> Hidalgo, uh, James is a uh, second year law student at Howard Law School. And we have Lauren Pittman, is Lauren here? Yes, uh, Lauren. Uh, Lauren is an undergraduate at the University of Maryland uh, College Park. And then finally, we have Brianna Welch, an undergraduate student at Bowie State, Bowie State University. <clears throat> I again thank all for coming. I hope to see you uh, next year at the same time. Uh, we have captured the second uh, Thursday each year uh, to be the annual Judge A.W. Lecture. Now, let me say this. Uh, next year and the years after, we'll have a national recognized speaker who will address some percolating uh, hot button issue. Uh, since this was my idea to have this lecture, I made y'all listen to me as the <laughs> first speaker. But you won't have to do that next year. We will have a national spokesperson to address that issue. Finally, uh, before we leave and go back as uh, food and drink, uh, if I can make a pitch for those who can and may not have taken the opportunity to contribute to the Judge A.W. Center, I recently delivered $10,000 toward the establishment of the Judge A.W. Center endowment. Now, $50,000 is required to establish the endowment, and my goal is to raise a minimum of $100,000 by this time next year. I do recognize that I will not, uh, uh, probably will not live forever, but, uh, <laughs> but my hope is to uh, continue the work of the center for years to come and to provide long-term funding and the financial stability to sustain the longevity of the center in perpetuity. Uh, again, uh, uh, checks uh, can be made payable this evening if you haven't already, or there is a sheet with information as to how you may assist with any your tax exempt or charitable donations toward the endowment, which will ensure the legacy of our uh, work uh, now and, and here and after. Please pick up these forms and consider making a donation. Uh, again, I wanted to hit you before the holiday rush comes in <laughs> when the other priorities uh, take place. But uh, this was a wonderful evening, and uh, I just am uh, so grateful and honored and humbled by your presence here today. Uh, uh, I have a, a passion to make this center become a national think tank. And uh, we're gonna get there, we're gonna be increasing our board and uh, we're gonna increase the reach. Uh, I do have plans to move to Baltimore City, uh, uh, extend uh, an office there because uh, so many uh, critical problems are presented in Baltimore City and that's where the action is and that's where I'm gonna be. So I certainly will stay here uh, at the University of Maryland. Uh, they've welcomed me with open arms, but uh, we're gonna be expanding this uh, center to uh, B-Town. Uh, is Billy still here? Okay, yeah, and uh, we're gonna uh, take advantage of uh, all the support that we have in uh, Baltimore City. So thank you this evening, and uh, have a good, uh, safe uh, trip home. 
uh, those who got awards. Can you come up so I can take pictures with everyone, all the groups that got their awards? Thank you so much and good evening.